Warren Occult Museum is one of the most unique and terrifying places on Earth and the most haunted area in the world due to the immense amount of items all held within this one space where nearly every item can see you and you can see it all at once. A room full of dark mysteries and even darker secrets. A collection so sinister, it is kept under lock and key, not only to keep people out, but to keep what is held within it from escaping. 9pm has always been the cutoff time for being inside the museum. This is when all of the cursed items come to life, and to their full power. A museum in which the tables are turned. Visitors do not only look and study each item on display, but the items watch, study, and listen to you. Entering the museum truly alone is impossible. One wrong move, one disrespectful action could mean an attack on your well-being, or even worse, your soul. We will have the chance to continue seeking answers from the same items Ed and Lorraine once did. And yes, that includes Annabelle. You're gonna be the first ones investigating this museum. Well, nothing bad happened. Something actually amazing happened. Well, I mean, we just opened 98 Divic boxes, so I'm sure anything that happens, you're gonna be happy with. Did something happen with the Divic box? Maybe, but something good happened. Well, okay, something okay. Something good well, happened. Are you still packed? Yes. So that means you're already ready to go to the airport tomorrow. What time do we have to leave? Uh, the flight leaves at 11 a.m. So we gotta get up at like 6 a.m. And, and I already booked the, the, the tickets, so. <laughs> we just came that's, home. That's... Oh. We just came back. <laughs> From 20 different places. Yes. And now we're going to one more. One more. Are you ready? Look, dude, we just handled 20 straight nights together in the motorhome, every haunted location in the Midwest. You might have cried at one point. I might have cried at one point. You thought I was gonna die. I thought you were gonna die. I thought I was gonna kill you. We all thought we were gonna kill each other. It was a lot of scary moments. It was really cool. We opened a lot of Divvy boxes. You know, all these fun things happened, but now we need to go to one more spot. I, okay, can you tell me what the spot is? No. What are you doing here? Yep. Second, why are you here alone? Third question, why do I have a camera? That's, that's probably the most important part. <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow? Do parkour, mainly. Cool, can you be on a flight tomorrow, please? This is gonna be the most dangerous handshake in the two world. Two days, two days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> Something cool to show everyone you're athletic. Uh, part-time ghost hunter, part-time professional athlete. Wow. Cool, see you in the morning. Uh, okay. Uh, do I need anything? Fuck. <laughs> what you doing? We just got back. Are you on my front doorstep with a camera? Why do you have so much mail at your front door? Because I'm lazy and we just got back. <laughs> you have a smile on your face. Mm -hmm. Fuck. Can you be at LAX at 11 a.m.? Please. <laughs> it's something cool, I promise. I'm not going anywhere far. New York City. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pack the camera gear. You just bring Wait, your clothes. Should I be afraid? Probably. Bye! <laughs> Hi. Yep. Uh, Where are you? I'm actually in a bus right now to go back to LA. And uh, I'm headed to like Newark, New Jersey. Wait, where are you right now then? I'm in New York City. Can you stay in New York for two more days? Why? We're all, we're all gonna be there tomorrow. In New York tomorrow? Yes, everyone. Corey, Corbin, Why? Evan all said yes. Can you stay there? Pay for your flight. Don't worry about your flight home. I'll cover it. Hey man, hey. whatever it is, huh? No, absolutely fucking not. You don't know how to behave. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> That's it. I dragged us all here. I know we just literally got home uh -huh. from here? three weeks on a trip, yeah. and all I said was, "Get to the airport." We're flying to JFK. Mm -hmm. Then flight. from there, we got in the rental car, and then I drove us around two hours, two and a half hours to here. Yes. Without telling us anything. No, because yeah. tonight is something special. Yeah, something it has I've... to be crazy. Now, did any of you happen to see what town we're in right now? I'd never look. No. 
So, we're in Connecticut. Okay. okay. Where? I thought we were still in New yeah. York. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're in Connecticut. And Jonah knew we were in Connecticut because Jonah's from Connecticut as well, which is really oh, bizarre yeah. Interesting. that we live not too far away like from each other. 20 minutes, yeah. He has yeah. A neighbor. This is Shelton. This is where I grew up. Oh. This is where Blake Shelton grew up. Mm -hmm. No, this is where Elton grew up. This is where you grew up. I haven't been back to this town for almost 13 years to the day. Oh, whoa. Wow. I know what we're doing now. We're going to investigate your old house. Strangely, growing up, I lived in a house that was within a cemetery. Mm -hmm. And I found out later that the house I grew up in was the old funeral home and possibly crematorium. And we're actually about a quarter mile away from No here. way. Wait, so you don't know the story, like the trampoline story? No. A lot of weird things happened to me, shit that you guys don't even know about. Stuff I've never told. That's the only story I've ever oh. told you. Oh, I didn't know that there was more. Why do you think I have absolutely no fear <laughs> of like demonic <laughs> anything? Wait. Why would you never tell us this? Was there a demon exactly in your right. house? Mm -hmm. Wait! Drive through the cemetery and I will show you the house I live in. Yeah, the fact yeah. that I just like was like, get on an airplane, this has to happen tonight. Yeah. No excuse. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not like the house has been sitting there for years and years and years and like I could have done this any other time with all the other times that we've been in the area. But tonight is like particularly the night that we have to be here. Super urgent, last minute, paid really expensive flights yeah. to be here tonight. Weren't we close? You know what I mean? So <laughs> like let's, let's go, ago. let's go see. My house. Wait, did you summon a demon in your house on this day? Let's hop in the car. The divic box is from the last places. Yeah, it's not like I like left 13 years ago, like to this day, or you know what I mean. It got 13 divic boxes to open before we. Whoa, didn't realize that. Think about that. That's kind of cool. And the last trip was 13 nights of investigations. Numbers. Did you summon a demon in your house growing up? What's eight plus eight? Haunted. Oh, 16. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. I was counting. Why do you guys don't count too hard? I don't know. I never know anything. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Can you guys even get in with those rigs on? No. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Film the license plate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's a Florida license plate. That is. Kind of weird. That is weird. Where, it's, where, you're, where you're from. Yeah. And I also lived in Florida. Yeah. Ooh, things are lighting up. Did you summon, Ooh. Did you summon a demon Ooh. in your house 13 years ago Ooh. today? Is that why we're here? Ooh. Do you think if I summoned a, a demon in my house 13 years ago today, you don't think I'd be doing it in every video we've been in? I would have learned how to do this years ago. I'd be an expert. I just have them on call. So, I have them like speed dial. Hey, sure. Delta. Come on. Get the car. That's the cemetery. That is indeed. Oh, that is the cemetery. Every day in my bedroom window had a perfect view of people getting buried. Oh my, bro, this is where you lived? Yeah, wait. All, you'll know the house when you see it. So this is why you're into ghost stuff. I don't know. You definitely grew up in a haunted house. Is that it? Wait, is that it? That's it. Whoa, that looks like a conjuring house. <laughs> Bro, this, that looks like a house we would investigate. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we couldn't find records for it, but the crematorium was in the basement. What? And that red hatch door where the crematorium oven, I guess, would have been is where I spent like all of my time. Well, we'll drive around and go say hello. Were you just gonna pull right up? Well, they don't know we're coming. Wait, what? And I don't think anyone's here. So we flew five hours for the owners to not know that we're here so that you could just knock on a door? Well, let's find out. I figured while we're in the area, I might as well come here, right? So this isn't the surprise? No. Wait. So the Wait. What's, the, what's the surprise? What's the surprise? Wait, actually... What's the surprise? Uh, I can only see his legs. I know, nobody can see him. Okay, Evan, do you know what's going on? I have no idea. I literally thought we we're gonna film at his house. Oh, he's knocking. He knocked. Oh my god, he's going to the basement. Could you imagine getting married to him and like he gets down on a knee and he's like, what do you think I'm gonna do? <laughs> you tell me. You, yeah, you exactly. tell me what I'm doing, Ginger. Get in the car. Yeah, get in the car. Get in the car. Hello. Get, we're going on a six hour flight. Oh, come on. <laughs> so what's the plan? Well, I'm gonna leave a note and then maybe they'll call us. You know I mean? You're here now. Let's just enjoy it. Let's just relax. Enjoy the creepy house that I grew up in. And let's okay. have some fun tonight. What, what do you mean, mean? enjoy the creepy okay. house? We don't even know if they're gonna let us in. Okay. We don't know, but you know, if you want, we can just go into the cemetery tonight and just stand outside their window holding candles and just wait till they let us in. I'll just stay in the That'll Dodge probably work, right? Dude, it was literally like a six hour flight. <laughs> we drove a couple hours. Dude. We're in Connecticut. I thought we were in New York. <laughs> and he won't tell us exactly what we're doing. House is still haunted, which I'm assuming it is. Imagine when the owners come home and they see this note on their door. I used to live here from 2004 to 2009. <laughs> the rumor has it there's a demon in the basement where I used to play drums. Please let me come into your house tonight at 3 a.m. I will give you $400. <laughs> That's 
not just him, five guys. Yeah, at least like put your LinkedIn or something on there. Yeah, exactly. Probably tape it to the outside of their mailbox. You're not allowed to put things in people's mailboxes. So which one of y'all know what we're doing? I have no fucking clue what we're doing. I, I literally have no idea. Do we believe Evan? Comment down below if we believe Evan. Just because of the handwriting. Hope it doesn't rain. So you're not gonna tell us. I'll tell you as we drive there. I've wanted to come here for forever, and I've been trying to come here for four years. The most famous paranormal investigators to have ever lived, basically. The Warrens. Yeah. So are we about to go see the Annabelle doll? <gasps> is that what this video is? We're gonna go see the Annabelle doll? Not just Annabelle. What else? The entire museum. <gasps> Dude! Dude, wait, 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 wait. I thought that wasn't even- No! I thought it wasn't even possible. Way. My last message with the guys that own it and run it was in 2019. <laughs> And then out of nowhere, I got a message saying, hey, do you still want to film here? We're investigating the Warren Museum. Holy yeah. cow. Oh my, okay, so it, they was, have made, it was worth the flight. They have made movies on so many items that are in this museum. It's a, it's a lot more. What are we doing? What are we doing? I'll let them tell you. Uh, you're not supposed to be in there after 9 p.m. We will be there after 9 p.m. Why aren't you supposed to be there after 9 p.m.? This is gonna be crazy. Like, what if you're not supposed to be there during those hours because that's when the items in there can attach to people? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, more likely. Yeah. That they that's do what, That's what's people. going on. Sure. They and, hear everything you're saying, and we're doing it anyway. And people have died because of some of these items. Mm-hmm. He is not wrong. Holy shit, Holy bro. shit, dude. This is intense. This is, this is really intense. I actually can't believe this is happening. Ed and Lorraine Warren are among the most well-known, if not the most well-known, paranormal investigators in the world. Having managed thousands of cases and considered to be prominent figures in demonology, they are pioneers of the paranormal community who paved the way for all future investigators and conversations to be had about what the spirit world is truly capable of. For more than 50 years, they sought to help those plagued by demons and spirits alike. It is believed that they have investigated over 10,000 different cases of paranormal activity. Although they have both passed away, Ed in 2006 and Lorraine in 2019, their stories, legacy, and collection of haunted artifacts still live on in infamy. Some of their most famous cases of the direct inspiration of the Conjuring Universe film franchise, which now has become the highest grossing horror franchise in history, with more than two billion dollars at the box office alone. Annabelle, The Conjuring, Amityville Horror, Enfield Poltergeist, Devil Made Me Do It, all of which have been based off of their true cases and documentation, with most of these artifacts being preserved within the Warren Museum. The location we are not only visiting, but conducting an eight-hour paranormal investigation of tonight. And yes, that means all throughout 3 a.m. Yet before we enter any location, we always seek to learn as much as we can about it, so we may have the best understanding of what we are facing. The history and importance of the Warren Museum, not only to our investigation, but the impact it had across the world, cannot be understated. Truly, if not for Ed and Lorraine, I do not believe this YouTube channel would exist, as they helped allow the love of paranormal to become normal. Ed and Lorraine's story begins when they first met in their youth. Lorraine was 16 when she met Ed at the Colonial Theater in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Ed was an usher at that time, and with Lorraine being a regular visitor at the theater, they would often see each other. It was through these visits that they eventually began dating. Yet their relationship was cut short when Ed was enlisted into the Navy to fight in World War II. He was deployed only four months as his ship was sunk and he was sent home on a 30-day survivor's lease. In 1945, during his 30-day leave, Ed and Lorraine decided to get married. The beginning of an eternal legacy. On July 6, 1950, their daughter Judy was born and in 1951 marked the conclusion of Ed's service in the Navy, allowing him to return home full time. Upon returning to Connecticut, Ed intended to be a professional painter. However, his other secret obsession was with ghosts and the afterlife. It's no secret that he grew up in a haunted house himself. Eventually, he found a way to meld his two worlds together, creating paintings of any home that was rumored to be haunted. Upon completion, he would then knock on the door of the home, 
and offer the painting to the owners, and in exchange, would be allowed into the home with the rain to conduct an investigation into the supernatural to see if the home truly was haunted. And by 1952, the paranormal became their main focus. After seeing how their lives aligned with the supernatural, they began to work together as a couple, investigating reported hauntings and various cases of demonic possession, both of which were devouting their lives and minds to becoming the most well-versed, skilled, and knowledgeable experts in the field. Yet these investigations and success that came from them were not simply achieved due to creating a painting and asking to walk around a haunted home. Both as devout Catholics, Ed specialized in demonology, and Lorraine possessed supernatural abilities herself as a psychic, medium, and clairvoyant. Their combination of research, paranormal investigations, science, and religion allowed them to hold a well-rounded and unique understanding of the world that lives beyond death. Becoming so renowned for his abilities to exorcise demons and evil spirits, religious authorities would call on him and Lorraine to assist in their worst cases. The phrase often tied to the Warren philosophy and based on their research in demonology is, The fairy tale is true. The devil exists. God exists. And for us, as people, our very destiny hinges upon which one we elect to follow. Lorraine's psychic gifts began development at the age of nine, beginning one day during her time at a private Catholic school. She would begin seeing light around people, and noticed that one nun in particular was glowing more brightly than the Mother Superior. It was from this time that she realized that the lights she was seeing were people's auras. Lorraine continued to develop her skills to become proficient as a trance medium as well as a clairvoyant. With these gifts, she was able to assist Ed in a way like no one else in the world could, creating a team willing to take on the most severe and terrifying cases brought to them. Those in need from all over the world would reach out in hopes to have their expertise to help combat the darkness that was consuming them. As their cases and evidence compounded, their need to be thoroughly organized grew. This led to the development and creation of the New England Society for Psychic Research, founded in 1952, became the first ghost hunting group in New England and spawned a path for future groups. The goal was to combine religion with science to study the paranormal. The Warren's investigation's work began to shift more towards the expelling of spirits, demons, and conducting exorcisms. At a time when stories of the paranormal were whispered at the loudest, Ed and Lorraine opened up the conversation about the devil, God, and the afterlife. They brought conversations about darkness to the public light. With over 10,000 cases they worked on with military, law enforcement, the church, reporters, and researchers, there was no shortage of information they were willing to present. Now, the true artifacts of their decades of research are held within their home, the Nesper headquarters, and the infamous Warren Museum. Each item with its own history, from some of the most remarkable and terrifying cases. We will have the chance to continue seeking answers and evidence from the same items Ed and Lorraine once did. And yes, that includes Annabelle. That's it. Museum closed. Please That's take it. notice. Violators prosecuted. Wow. No trespassing. Bro, this is it. This is nuts. Oh my. How many people must show up here that they have to kick out? I remember watching one of the videos where Ed said that no one had ever broken in, but many of people had broken out. I can't believe we're here, bro. This is crazy. This is legendary. Everyone's here. <laughs> for, I think they're gonna come out in a minute to meet us. So we have our normal cameras. Yeah. Yes. We have our infrared GoPro cameras. We yeah. have our night vision cameras. But additionally, we have something else that we're filming with tonight because we're going to be the very first ones to do a paranormal investigation here. Besides them, who own the place at 3 a.m. What? What? At the devil's hour. Yes. We're gonna be in the most unholy place. And we're the first people to decide to them. <laughs> yes, I asked for special permission. I was like, is there any possible way? How did you hear? get that? What is that thing? Oh, that's sick. Wait a second. This oh, is a, that is this sick. This is an early 1980s VHS camera. <laughs> that's a fossil. <laughs> and we have actual Whoa, wait, tape wait, 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 audio wait, wait, wait. recorders. 
for all. No so way. the original EVP. Can so I see this? This is the way. What the heck? This is the way the Warrens would have done it. They didn't have tools. So they just had their mind themselves. I am so down. Look at this. And we have hey. Tony. Hey! <laughs> hey. Oh, man. How you yeah. doing? This is Tony Sparrow, son-in-law of the Warrens, married to their daughter, Judy. This couple met in 1979 when Judy accidentally waved to him, thinking he was someone else. Became love at first sight, and the rest is history. Tony is now director of Nesper, as well as the owner and manager of the Warren Occult Museum. Since the 1980s, Tony had worked closely with the Warrens and continues their work to this day. Originally a police officer, he is now known for his work in the paranormal field while also consulting for numerous films such as The Conjuring series. He took up the gauntlet after the passing of the Warrens and helps pave the way for the paranormal community through his lectures and presentations at colleges and on YouTube as well. Hey, it's nice to meet you, Corbin. Corbin, you yeah. Elton. 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 Thank you for having Corey. us. Corey. Corey and Jonah. who are these guys? Evan. Evan. Jonah, pleasure. Jonah, hey, please meet you guys. This is Eric, one of my yeah, team members. Yeah, yeah. Chris so Gorn, nice Hi guys. to you. Hey. Team member. Came ready tonight. You this can is... see how excited we are. We'll be able to track down one of these. Yeah. Whoa, you got the old yeah. school. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Ed, Ed Warren used to have one. Almost hit an RCA like this. Really? really? This is what he got. Uh, an image of the white lady on the what? Union graveyard with this. Yeah. Really? He used this. And you know, there was no night vision or anything back then. No. Yeah. Just this these are very low quality compared to today. Of course. Yeah. But he was able to capture some good stuff just using this old school. You like the old school, yeah. you like the old school. So do I. This is Ed's uh, go to. Ed had open real tape decks. He'd cart that thing around with a big <laughs> microphone, set it all up in the person's house when he was interviewing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or he'd go to a place and he would ask questions like at a grave site, try to get an EVP on his tape, and he would sometimes get it. Wow. Those things worked. Yeah. And then he would. He went to the cassette. When he interviewed somebody, he always brought a cassette. If you watch the Conjuring 1 movie, mm -hmm. you'll say it's November 1st, 1971. Yep, all at the this. Parent House, and you hear him hit the cassette. Yep, I have some of, those, <laughs> some of them in the museum. That's oh, yeah. awesome. They used Lorraine's psychic ability as the equipment. That's why it's tough to match them as a team, because Ed was a seasoned investigator but also a demonologist in other words he read everything he could on demonology everything the reason why he did it he lived in a haunted house in bridgeport connecticut one time he was sleeping with his twin sister they had separate beds but they were in one room and his grandfather had recently died he says to me we're sleeping all of a sudden we're awakened by a sound of a cane hitting the stairs coming up to the second floor and footsteps and a cane. He was my grandfather always carried a cane. Oh. And he said the cane and the footsteps got up to the bedroom and they were circling their beds. Oh my god. And he said, I said, what do you do? And he said, I had covers all over me. Yeah. Had, my sister and I were so frightened. We had the covers over us. We could hear the cane oh. tapping all around the bed. Yeah. The museum that you guys are gonna have special privileges <laughs> to go into. Wow. You know, because you guys are our friends, kind of. <laughs> we met you today and you seem friendly. So, <laughs> people used to start saying, Ed, I got this haunted object. Ever since I bought this object at a tag sale, I had this, the next day I saw a shadow figure or whatever it was. Or I used this Ouija board and now I got a problem. Yeah. Or there's a statue I bought and it's, somebody must have cursed it. And it. Can you take it off my hand, Mr. Warren? And you did. You know what, all right, let's clear out the art studio and then make it in the cult museum. I mean, people always ask him, why do you keep those objects? He said, Tom, when I talk about something like the Annabelle doll, and what happened, you give the whole story of it, and then people say, well, where's the doll now? And I go, oh, I threw it in a dumpster. <laughs> it's not here anymore, I burned it. Oh, no, we, we destroyed that. No evidence. He said, it's for people who want to learn more about the paranormal. This is evidence. If he wasn't on a case, he'd be studying more than you can imagine. I could bring in the museum whenever you guys are ready. And uh, on the way, I'll show you that little sign that says Barn Door Studios. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't take it down yet. Oh, is that that sign? That's nice. amazing. After you, Corey. So he made that sign? Yeah. That's, yeah, dude, this was his studio. That's amazing, dude. Oh, are you guys ready? I'm ready. Ed used to teach about the paranormal. If you could say that word three times fast, I'll let you in. <laughs> Say it, go ahead. Paranormalology. Paranormal. 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 Paranorm
We did it. Let's go in. This is going to be like a once in a lifetime for you guys, right? Because you haven't been here before. No, we have not. Uh, please be respectful when you go in. Of course. Don't touch anything. And I'll explain some of the, some of the major things that are in there, okay? I'm yeah. not going to give you everything that's in there. Of course. I want you guys to close your eyes and envision yourselves, all of you each, in a covered in a white light all around your body. See, your aura is your supernatural glow around your body. Everything that God has created that's alive has an aura around it. They're all different, like a fingerprint. But that's where evil, that's where the demonic would try to enter through your aura if you have a chink in it. If you have a weak spot in your aura, that's where the devil goes for it. So how do you protect it? By envisioning yourself in a glowing white light all around your aura. Then ask God to protect you from anything evil, otherworldly, demonic, or inhuman. God will protect you with that white light. Ed used to use it, Lorraine used it, I use it, all our team guys use it. It's got us through a lot of stuff. So that's your extra armor of protection when we go into a place like this. You could do that when you go into a haunted location, cemetery, a haunted house, anywhere where evil might be prevalent, you know what I mean? Yeah. So let's go. Let's go in. The Warren Occult Museum is one of the most unique and terrifying places on Earth and the most haunted area in the world due to the immense amount of items all held within this one space where nearly every item can see you and you can see it all at once. Haunted pictures and paintings, animal skins and masks used for black magic, real human skulls utilized in rituals, cursed statues, dolls, toys, musical instruments, voodoo artifacts, vampire coffins, tombstones, witchcraft items, and an endless list with a deadly history. A room full of dark mysteries and even darker secrets, yet to be unlocked from the items they are contained within. A collection so sinister, it is kept under lock and key, not only to keep people out, but to keep keep what is held within it from escaping. Many of the items have been used for black magic or the occult in an attempt to hurt others, often having succeeded in either harming or killing. Many of the previous owners of these objects have ended up in mental institutions due to the strong effects and influence each item has. There is an immense amount of spiritual protection here to contain the evil within the objects, all of which comes from those that care for the museum. Hosting a collection unlike anywhere else in the world, all items here here are considered unholy, cursed, and evil. To touch an item is to condemn oneself, to invite demons and evil spirits to attack, and consume your physical and spiritual energies. Special protection is put in place to handle any item in the museum, and only a few people are capable of doing so, all of which are with us tonight. 9 p.m. has always been the cutoff time for being inside the museum, and this lockdown continues until 6 a.m. This isn't about closing the museum for the night, but this is when all of the cursed items come to life and to their full power. Even from behind the wards and protections, they become extremely dangerous. This window of time is known as the psychic hours, and a smaller window within it is known as the devil's hour, 3 a.m., when the devil is mocking the holy trinity, empowering all items and spirits of an evil being. Even when Ed and Lorraine were still present, they would not be in the museum during those hours. Entering the room alone is at the risk of each person. The young man died in an accident hours after visiting the museum where he was challenging Annabelle. A priest, as well as a detective, were nearly killed in the museum as well. A museum in which the tables are turned. Visitors do not only look and study each item on display, but the items watch, study, and listen to you. Entering the museum truly alone is impossible. One wrong move, one disrespectful action could mean an attack on your well-being, or even worse, your soul. Wow. Come on in. Kind of cool, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that, what are you saying? Kinda. This is oh, awesome. Wow. Got the shot. Got that light coming in. What you're going to see wow. immediately when you first walk in here, create what's called a topa, a human manifestation of the mind. If you have the knowledge, if you have the power, if you are high enough essence, can create things like that. A group would get together and they would take masks like this, put them on their, on their, over their face, and then hope to be able to remove the mask and have that image still there, creating a devil or a demon for themselves. Over here though, 
We call this the shadow doll. Look at it. People say, why do you call it a shadow doll? Yeah. Well, look at it. Look at it. Look at it looks. Yeah. It's That's, ugly. Yeah. There's nails coming out of it. There's a human tooth coming out of it. What? But there's bird hair, bird feathers, I should say, animal bone. That was created specifically for one reason and one reason only, to cause distress to other people if used in a proper manner. So if I was very knowledgeable in sorcery and wizardry, and I knew how to do it, I would take a photograph of this and print out the photo. On the back of the photo, I would write the curse Ooh. that I want. Right. Say towards, say towards Elton. Ha! Elton, I don't like, because Elton tried to steal my girlfriend away. Something yeah. happened where I don't like Elton anymore, or, or in a business venture or something. Now I, I want to get rid of Elton. I write a curse specifically for Elton, because I'm knowledgeable in incantations and curses, we'll say. I send it in the mail, the picture, with the curse on the back to Elton or to you. Just by you opening the envelope and seeing the photo, you accept that the curse is written on the back, unbeknownst to you. If the person is powerful enough as a sorcerer or a wizard, it's called a shadow doll because it can come to you in your dreams if it's done right. It has been known to scare people in a nightmare so badly that it can stop your heart. That's why people wear a crucifix that's blessed or a medal that's blessed. That's the opposite. This would be the opposite of something that's holy and blessed. This would be the unblessed. Even though we have every item in here blessed by a priest that comes in here and he blesses these objects, he does the whole museum, then he goes with holy oil and does his thing. These are from Africa, utility dolls from Africa. Are they powerful? Yeah, they're powerful, and I'll tell you why. These were stolen from a witch doctor in Africa and sent to a man here in Bridgeport, Connecticut. If I can get those here and sell them on the black market, I can make myself some dough. The story is, this young 28-year-old police officer, two weeks after he got these, he became paralyzed from the neck down. Doctors couldn't even figure out what was wrong with him. He couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't move. And for about a year and a half, he was like that, and he finally passed away. Now, was it from the fertility dolls? I'd say so. You can't prove it, right? It's hard to prove some of these things. But why would you take that kind of a chance with the unknown realm? There's powers out there that we don't know about. But here, we have just a regular, like a household mirror, right? But we call it a conjuring mirror. Why? because people have tried to conjure spirits through mirrors for many, many different years. People call it scrying, I call it crystal omancy. Mm. In other words, if there's a shiny object, it's easy for a spirit to reflect their image on a shiny object. We had a gentleman from New Jersey, actually. He's now at a mental institution because he dr drove him crazy. What he did was he replicated what we call a psychomantium. A psychomantium is a darkened room. When I say darkened, I mean blackened. You would sit down in a chair here, so all you could basically see, or barely see, is the mirror. This guy, he would sit here for hours, looking at the mirror and say, Grandma, Grandma, I want to see my grandmother, I miss you, or my father, different relatives that he lost. He would sit there for two and three hours, beckoning them to come to him through the mirror. What was he doing? He was trying to conjure spirits. Was two weeks he did that straight, nothing happened. But then, suddenly monstrosity, faces of monstrosities started to come through to this guy. It scared the living heck out of him. It frightened him so badly, like I said, he ended up in a mental hospital, this guy. Jeez. You can do the same thing. Now, I wouldn't want you to, no. and the audience listening, I wouldn't ever want you to do that. If you do something long enough and with enough intention, it's to the spirit realm, it's going to ha happen. Something's going to come through. It's probably not going to be your mom or your dad or your grandmother or your mm -hmm. grandfather mm -hmm. because the demonic can trick you. In other words, it could be someone who looks like your mom, your dad, your girl, whoever passed away, they come in the guise mm -hmm. of who you want them to be yeah. because they, the demonic, want to be invited into your life. Mm -hmm. As soon as you invite them in, even if it's unbeknownst to you, it's almost impossible to get rid of a demonic entity then, because you, you invited him into your realm. The demonic goes after the weak will. Now, if you're strong in faith and you're just stoic, you're like a John Wayne type of guy, and you believe in God, and God's going to protect me, they, a lot of times they don't mess with you. This is a, an organ from the Phelps house. They were clearing it out, and somebody called up Ed and said, Ed, would you like to have one, an artifact from that uh, Phelps mansion? And he said, yeah, I'll take whatever you got. Ed said from upstairs in the kitchen, he could hear the organ playing. And he'd say, nobody's supposed to be in the museum. Would they break in? He'd run down the stairs, come here, and 
the strains of the organ would stop. Three different times here. It's not a player wow. organ. We have the remnants of Flight 401. These parts here are actual pieces of the wreckage wow. air, aircraft. I'm telling, I'm telling you, I had a visit from Don Rico. I came home, it was raining, pouring out. He's under the tree was a guy in the flight outfit, flight navigator outfit with a hat, he had rain gear on. And he's standing in front of the tree, staring at Ed when he pulled in the driveway. And then Ed gave a double take and the guy was gone. Mm -hmm. Now who's Don Repo? He was a flight navigator that went down with the crew and the passengers. Eastern Airlines, that's not no longer in business, they took pieces of the wreckage that they found mm -hmm. that were still good, yeah. like seats, the galley carts, the voice and flight recorders, and used them on other planes. The other planes that they were used on, guess who showed up? Don Repo. Yeah. Don Repo was seen by the pilots, oh. the co-pilot, the flight attendants, and the passengers. They got so many <laughs> reports of seeing this guy sitting in full uniform in one of the passenger seats, and sometimes he'd go like this, Whoa. and then disappear. Why? They had so many reports that Eastern Airlines finally said, let's take those parts <laughs> off the plane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they did. Yeah. And then when they took the parts off the plane, the whole thing stopped. Oh, Scott. There's things in this world you can't explain. Yeah. And anybody out there that thinks that you don't live after you die is wrong. I used to ask Lorraine a lot at lectures, oh, why do you believe that? And she said, it's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of evidence. We get so much evidence that people live on after they pass away. Visions of people people communicating, shadow figures, a full vision of someone that you lost. An apparition, by the way, is a spirit that you can recognize. Mm -hmm. A ghost is a spirit that you don't recognize. Mm -hmm. so in other words, if a ghost appeared right here and I didn't know the identity, I'd call it a ghost. But you'd say, that's my grandmother. That's an apparition that's of an your apparition. grandmother. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. That's the only difference in terminology. Borley Rectory. I went there with Ed and with my wife and Lorraine. My wife immediately got sick when she got on the property. She's psychic, my wife, but she doesn't like to admit it. She liked to play with it. Lorraine was fearless. She would go to a place and she developed her psychic awareness. When you hone in and tune in like that on so many investigations, your ability just gets better and better. A lot of the people in England and Scotland, they do believe in ghosts. They don't talk about it much, but they believe in it because they've experienced it. So that's why Ed and Lorraine went a lot. And I went with them about four different times. It's great. Yeah, we were there uh, last end of last year. Where'd you go? Uh, all, over. all over. Honestly, we did Ireland, Northern Ireland. So, uh, we didn't touch Scotland and then England. We actually tried going to the Enfield house. Oh, you did? We tried like Green leaving. Street? Yeah, Green we like Street? left a note to be like, hey, if it's possible. Oh, that would have been cool to be I know, but yeah. they didn't answer. Oh, I could tell you a little bit about that. I didn't visit it, but my my wife did, and of course Ed and Lorraine did. John told me a story. John Kenny Hurst told me, told me a story. He's sitting on the couch in the Enfield house. All of a sudden, he said, Tone, I hear this plopping noise. I said, yeah. He goes, and I looked down, and in front of me is this big pile of crap. He goes, and it was, it looked just like human crap, but it was big, like horse size. But it was right there. I said, well, did it dematerialize again? He goes, no, we had to clean it up. What? It just, out of nowhere, a plop sound. He looked down, and there it was. What? Human excrement on the ground. And Lorraine was standing in the kitchen. All of a sudden, wallpaper just tore away from the wall, floated around over the one light that was there to block her light. Lorraine wanted to stand under the light. She said, when I stood under the light, I felt better in this house. The voices from Enfield, England were amazing. Oh. If you watch The Conjuring 2 at the end, you'll hear the actual oh voices. Yeah. But Ed had hours of those voices that we just converse with Ed. Now that's the, the key. The, the key is communication back and forth. John Kennyhurst was asked by Ed to go out to the car. John, the priest can't come today. Go, about 10 minutes later, comes back. And Ed's like, well, where's the holy water? And John says, there is no holy water, Ed. He goes, I know where it was. It is no longer there. Mm. It's gone. I can't find it. Ed says, well, you know what? We're going to make our own with holy water. Give me some salt. Give me some water. Ed did like a simple, his own blessing over it, which is not really holy water. So then Ed said, well, we're going to do a blessing on the house. He says, hand me the holy water, John. And out of the blue, a voice says, but it's not blessed. Just like that. So they could understand and see whatever Ed was doing. Wow. It's not blessed. And I was like, what? 
But they start talking back and forth with him. They're mocking Ed. Ah, they're laughing. It's not black. That's the power of demonic entities. Wow. Those are the kind of crazy things that happen in, in, in the infield house. Jesus. Why? I gotta try again to get back in there. That's, <laughs> that is, dude, that's... Wow. That's Isn't that insane? Isn't that's that insane. Of, if I can get I the house, you want me to invite you? The things in that house, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd like to come. All right. The <laughs> things in that house that were just amazing. People would say, well, Ed and Lorraine weren't there. But let me just tell you this much. They weren't there for months or years. They were only there for maybe a week. But during that week, they helped out Margaret and Janet and Peggy more than uh, from the England Cyclical Institute did, according to Janet and Margaret. When Janet and Margaret saw Lorraine on the set of The Conjuring 2, they started crying, they were hugging Lorraine. And they said it right to the crew and me. They're the only ones that ever helped us. Lorraine and Ed are the only ones that ever really helped us or tried to help us. Oh, pearls, pearls of death. They were given to a lady. Wow. As soon as she put them on, she felt that she was being strangled to death. Yeah. Like somebody took them and twisted them and were trying to kill her. Wow. So they had to snap them off her. Why? Maybe there's a curse attached to them. I don't know. But they were given to Ed for that reason. Why are you so comfortable touching everything? Just because you're around it all the time? Yeah, yeah because I'm around it. Not only that, I, these items have been blessed and I protect myself like we did outside. Went to confession first yeah. before I met you guys today. Ed said to me when he did it, he said he could pick them up, so I assumed that I could pick them up. The things I won't touch are things like Annabelle, things like the satanic idol, the shadow doll, I won't touch those. And in fact, I'm just gonna show you the Annabelle doll now, actually. Come over I, here, guys, I'll show you the Annabelle doll. That case doll. is so much larger than wow. I thought it was. This is a long story, but I'm gonna tell it to you because if you want the real story, Thank you, and what happened here? Right. That's a handwritten sign by Ed. Positively, do not open. He wrote that years and years ago. I think he wrote it probably in 77, 78. People ask me why the devil tarot card is here. Ed put it there, so we leave it there. It's a different case, but we put it there. This item here is probably the most dangerous item. That's why it's in a case. And I'm not going to touch it. I never touch it. Not with bare hands. Oh. People say, well, you know, didn't you bring it to Las Vegas? I did bring it to Las Vegas, but I know how to protect myself, and I'll tell you how I know. Ed showed me, he said, if you ever have to move the doll, the way to do it is this. But when you handle the doll, you don't handle it with your bare hands. Ed told me, wear a pair of like heavy welding gloves. Make sure your hands were drenched in holy water first before you even put the gloves on. And envision yourself in a white light, and ask God for protection from anything evil that might be attached to Annabelle. But it's rare that we move it. We try not to move it very often. There are times though when we have to move it, like when we have to repair the case, which we're gonna have, we'd have to do. We would have to repair this case and move the doll. What he does, Dan Rivera, my lead investigator, he made this case. What he does is he gets stain, he gets water, he brings it to the priest, and he has the priest bless it. Wow. Then when he built this case, he stains it with the holy water and oil combination with the stain infused in it. Behind the doll, behind the felt, he has a prayer written in there, the Our Father. Mm. On the sides, if you want to catch that with the camera, he cut out crosses mm -hmm. on both sides, put a cross here, and he has two plaques, the St. Michael the Archangel prayer. We consider that a protection. Not total protection, because you never know. Yeah. That's why we don't touch it with our bare hands. That's why it's glass. So the story of Annabelle. You ready for this? Oh, absolutely. Lorraine and Ed got a call from two nurses. They said, we have this item and we think it's causing a lot of problems with us. Can you come over? So they went over the house and Lorraine. They visited these two girls. One of her names was Donna. She's the one who received the doll from her mother as a birthday gift. Now Donna was about 28 years old at the time. But she liked dolls. A lot of girls like dolls. I don't blame them. You know, it's nice. It's like we like model cars. Nothing's wrong with the doll that they can see. Everything's fine. They even put a little gold bracelet on the doll's wrist there that you can see later. She would carry the doll all over the house. One day, while they're at the breakfast nook, I know it's going to sound illogical and crazy, they're sitting at the breakfast nook and the doll is next to them. Her and her, her roommate was a nurse also. All of a sudden, those two flimsy rag hands levitated onto the table like this, together, like this, and landed there. Now the girls look at each other. How about you? I'd be a little panicky, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't. They were more intrigued, like, 
The, the other nurse says to Donna, she goes, hey, the Don must be trying to tell us something. And Donna says, yeah, look, look, maybe, I mean, and the other one goes back and says, well, I know a psychic. Why don't we call her in? We'll have a, we'll have like a, a seance or something and see if she, we could find out what she wants. That's what they did. Yeah. That was their first mistake was giving it recognition like that. Yeah. So they did. They had a friend come in that night around the table and do a seance. Here's what the psychic says. I'm picking up the spirit of a young girl who was killed in a car accident outside your apartment complex. She's about seven years old and her name is Annabelle. She's in your doll. That's what she says to the girls. The girls bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. Now the psychic didn't know what the hell she was talking about because God does not allow a human spirit to enter inanimate objects. Like in other words, when you go home tonight, your grandmother's not in your living room chair. A demonic entity could be attached. Now they're intrigued and they're saying, wow, there's a human spirit in our doll. And they said they really treat it with more reverence, you know, more like, like it's human. Donna had the doll on the edge of a couch in the open. And Lou, who's Donna's fiance, was sitting on, laying on the other end of the couch, sleeping. He wakes up with a start. He's sweaty. He's like, heart pumping. He's holding his chest. He's like, man, I just had the worst nightmare. And Don's like, what happened? What happened, Lou? And he points at the doll. He says, I just had a dream that that doll there was crawling up my leg and it got to my neck and started to strangle me. That was his dream, nightmare. What's he do? He grabs the doll off the couch because he's, he's angry and he's nervous. Grabs the doll, he picks it up, he throws it all across the room on the carpet. He says, that's just a raggedy hand doll, can't hurt anybody. When he said that, Seven psychic wounds appeared on his chest and on his stomach. Four this way and three this way that came through his t-shirt. Like somebody took a scalpel and they could see the blood coming through the t-shirt. Now they're freaked out. Now Donna and their girlfriend and Lou are like, wait a minute, that can't be a seven-year-old girl inside that doll. Something's wrong here. They called a high Episcopal canon in Hartford. He didn't know what to do. He said, you know, I'm not versed in this kind of stuff. He said, why don't you call the Warrens? They know all about this stuff. Ed Lorraine get there. They had a priest come with him and did an exorcism of the house. And the girl said, well, what are you gonna do with the doll, Ed? We don't want that doll. Can you take it? I said, I'll bring it back to my museum. So I took it back to the museum in his car. He had like an old Chevy. As a, on the way home, the car's jerking, stopping, stalling. He never did that before. He had trouble controlling it, bouncing off the curbs. Finally, he stops the car. He had holy water. He always kept it in his pocket in a, in a little plastic bottle. He sprinkled holy water on it. And he said the sign of the cross and said, they are father. And he said they were able to make it home. When he did, he put it in a chair, like this chair right here. Put it in a corner over here. You could just reach over and grab it. But he put a little yellow tape. It's a danger, do not touch. So that was fine for a while, right? A priest, Father Bill, he comes over in the daytime, has lunch with Ed and Lorraine upstairs. After they're eating lunch and having tea, he says to Ed, hey Ed, can I see that doll that I heard so much about that put slashes on people? That's how he said it. Yeah, it says, come on down, Father, I'll show it to you. He gets to the doll, starts to talk about the doll that's in the corner, and he starts to talk, he gets to the part with the slash marks with Lou, and the priest, like, doesn't want to know. The priest goes, what? He reaches over the tape, grabs the doll, that's the guy, he grabs the doll, you know what he does? He grabs it, almost like Lou, throws it across the museum and says, God is more powerful than any devil or demon. Ed says, Father, why'd you do that? I told you not to touch anything priest says, I don't care. God is more powerful. Ed says, you know what, Father, you're right. God is more powerful than any devil or demon, but no human being is. No priest. You shouldn't have touched it. Priest didn't want to hear it. They go back upstairs. Ed's not too happy with the priest, by the way. They say their goodbyes. The priest gets in his brand new car and leaves. The priest never made it to his diocese that night because the car went out of control, almost head out into a tractor trailer, destroyed the car, and injured the priest. It didn't kill him. That injured him. Two days later, the priest calls up, crying, to, crying on the phone to Ed. He tells him about the accident. He says, "You know what, Ed? He says, the last thing I can recall was looking in the rearview mirror, and I saw an image of that doll. And I, then I lost control of the car." It's like, the fella, I mean, I don't know what to tell you, but yeah, I told you not to touch the doll. Ed used to give these little tours of the museum. He used to charge like five or ten dollars, or twelve dollars. He'd have a group of college kids would call up. He'd say, "Oh, if you get ten kids." I'll, I'll give you an hour and a half tour. And one of the kids came on a motorcycle with his girlfriend. Gets to the doll. Now, at this time, the doll's in a case. Because after all these incidents, as Ed said, I'm going to have to have the case built. 
which was that case there. That is really? the original case. Uh, no way. That's where that's the original case right there, and that's where we're going to put it when we transfer the valve for repairs. Temporarily, we put her back right there. That was the case that the young man ran up to. Ed's talking about the doll. He gets again to the slash. I guess the slash marks like a trigger. Mm -hmm. He talks about the slash marks appearing psychic wounds. The young man breaks the crowd, breaks in the crowd, runs up to the glass, starts banging on the glass with his fingers, and says, "This is a bunch of bull. If that doll can put slashes on somebody, do it to me." What did he do? He challenged. He challenged the doll. Ed's like, "Hey, you." You and your girlfriend, you got to get out of here. I can't have that. I just got through telling you people, don't disrespect the doll, don't challenge, get out. Kid's mocking it on the way out, laughing with his girlfriend. He never made it home. Mm. Three hours later, they found out that he was killed on that motorcycle Jesus. when he went head on into a tree. Now, how do we know what happened? The girl didn't die. She was in a hospital for many months, though. And she said, when interviewed, the last thing she recalled was laughing and joking about the doll with him before we lost control of the bike. Uh, I've looked at that doll many times. I've never challenged it. I've never said, I want to see something happen. I never said, I want to see the doll move. I never said, if you can do something to me, do it. No, that's ridiculous. That's stupid. It's like going up to Mike Tyson, say, go ahead, hit me. Okay, you think you can hit me? You think you're tough? Why would you challenge? So over here is, is the, the movie, movie doll. Is the movie at all? Oh, wow. I did this not is even one see of that. the movie dolls. But that's one of the dolls right there. The Warner Brothers was super nice and allowed us to have one. Now, do you believe this is just a normal doll, or do you believe because of the intention they put into this for the movie that it also has? Well, that you never know. That's why she's in a case. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's why I was asking. That's exactly. one of the reasons you never know. Look. You never know. Yeah. It's right here. The Satanic Ooh. Idol of Newtown. This is a mind blower, and I'll tell you why. Something terrible happened to this, this idol, and it happened to Lorraine. 1991, Ed gets a phone call from a young man, about 22 years old, who's a bow and arrow hunter hunting deer in the woods in Sandy Hook. And if you know Sandy Hook, you know what happened there, the tragedies. But this was way before that happened. He gets lost looking for deer. All of a sudden he stumbles on a grotto of rocks. On top of it is the idol. He never saw anything like this before. As a matter of fact, I didn't either. He starts to walk away down this pathway, scared. He says his heart's pounding because he feels funny looking at that thing. As he's walking away, this is the crazy part right here. Out of nowhere in the summertime, in the middle of the woods somewhere, a guy appears right next to him, all dressed in black from head to toe, about 70, 72 years old, snow white hair combed back, short cropped snow white beard, walking step for step with this young man. As the kid's walking, this guy's walking with him without looking at him. I got so scared, I, I wanted to just take an arrow out of my quiver and go like this and stab the guy. I was so frightened of the guy. I said, well, you didn't do that, right? He goes, of course not. He goes, but I didn't muster up enough energy to say, how do I get out of this place? Mm -hmm. The man never looked over at him, stared straight ahead, never spoke, pointed off to the right like this, and then walked away. He gets to the road, he finds his car, goes home, tells his buddies. His buddies say, well, why don't you just call Ed Warren? He lives right in Monroe, the next town over. Ed meets him. They walk into the woods. They find the idol. As they're walking in, Ed, he tells Ed about this, this guy. More detail. Ed sees the idol. He immediately says, I know what that is, and I know who the guy is. A satanic worship idol. It doesn't belong here. It's Satanists that are using this. It's good that you told me about it, because I'm going to take it back with me. It doesn't belong here. So he takes the idol, puts it in the back seat of the car, and comes home. Nothing happens for a day, nothing happens for two days. Third day, Ed's out in the driveway fixing the wipers on his car, and Lorraine is about 20 feet or so back watering some flowers with a hose. She looks at Ed, she goes, Ed, after we're done, we'll go have lunch. Ed's like, yeah, no problem, as soon as I fix my wipers. He goes back to doing the wipers. He looks back towards Lorraine, she's no longer there. Just like seconds later, she's like 25 yards up in the backyard, lying down in a fetal position, semi-conscious. No hose, no nothing. Ed drops everything, runs to Lorraine, panicky. What's it, Lorraine, what's the matter? She doesn't answer him. She's like semi-conscious. He calls the ambulance and the police. They come, they bring her to St. Vincent's Hospital in Bridgeport. She's there for three days, in and out of consciousness. I went with Judy the next morning to see her. She could hardly talk. She just about recognized her, her own daughter. 
and she was almost like somebody hit her with a baseball bat and she had the flu. Yeah. That's how she was acting, like just out of it. Doctors did all kinds of tests, brain scans, everything else. The third day, she snaps out of it. She's perfectly fine. Doctor said, she can go home, Ed. She's fine. There's nothing wrong. We can't find anything wrong with her. She said, I want to get out of here. I'm hungry. I want to eat. And she comes home. She's fine. The next day, I come over to see Ed. I go, Ed, can we go look at the statue again? So I come in and look at the statue. Whatever happened with Lorraine? What, what did the doctor say? He said, they never told me, Tom. He goes, but they didn't need to tell me. I know what happened. He goes, that son of a bitch. And he gave me the guy's name. He goes, his name is, he told it. He's, he's a German guy, he's a high priest in a satanic cult. And he did that to Lorraine as a warning to me. He goes, I know he did. He goes, he didn't mess with me directly because he knows I have a lot of knowledge on reverse ceremonial magic and that I could be damaging too. But he wanted to warn me because I stole his idol out of the woods. He goes, as soon as that kid told me the description of this guy, I knew who it was. Here's the crazy part. He told me his name once. It's a German name. But I'm not going to repeat it. Mm -hmm. Tell you why. So I said, "Oh, okay. Is he powerful, huh?" And I'm talking. Yeah, he's real powerful. Two months later, I said, "Hey, Ed, what's that guy's name again? That satanic priest guy?" Ed said, "I'm not going to tell you what his name is. You got to remember it, or you don't remember." I go, "Come on, Ed." Here's what he said to me. Every time I mention that goddamn guy's name, something bad happens to me or to us. I go, "Really?" He goes, "Yeah, that's how powerful the guy is." I don't even like to repeat his name. He says to me, "This is going to freak you out a little bit." I didn't learn this until about a year or so ago. The person who's responsible for the, <coughs> for the death of all those children lived on Yogananda Drive in Newtown or Sandy Hook. A young man who murdered his best friend and kidnapped his girlfriend about five or six years ago. He lived on Yogananda Drive. This high priest in a satanic cult, who well, I'm not going to tell you his name, lived on Yogananda Drive before he died. Now, what's going on? Three things like this guy was a high priest had a lot of power had told me a lot of power he lived on the same street as that killer and the other killer yeah. i mean there's no proof to anything but yeah to me it's kind of too coincidental to be anything other than something that i was up to that priest up well but here's the dinosaur that was used in the brookfield case and the devil made me do a case thank you thanks how is it so far Great, man. I, I can listen to you all, all night. Incredible. I, got, yeah. I love this. I got to tell you guys the truth. So I want you to have a detailed Yeah, no, post. I, there's one thing I want to ask, because um, I'm not fully sure they're aware, but Annabelle's being moved tonight, Yeah. correct? Yeah. From the current case to the original. Yeah. What time is it now? What's going to happen tonight? What time is it now? 7.30. 10, 11 o'clock, I think, we're going to move it. But you guys You're are moving it the, from the yeah. current case to the original yeah. case? Yeah. yeah. And then it'll be in the original case when we're in here at three in the morning. What? Yeah, Wait it will. a minute. It will. The original case. The mm -hmm. real, the one it, it had it in originally. Yeah. Annabelle is not to be messed with, you know no. what I mean? Because a lot of crap has happened with that doll. I mean, in fact, we had some people here one time on a tour. So you having a good time tonight? Because we were going to see the museum, go to a graveyard, see Ed's grave. And have Lorraine come with us and then go to dinner after that, like a whole meal, a whole, whole, whole evening. She looks at me, she says, I only came to see the doll. So I laugh. I go, You don't like care about Lorraine or me? Mm. I laugh. She goes, No, I came to see the doll. I've been thinking about that doll for two days. Recognition. Mm. So I said, Oh, you want to take a picture next to it? So she stood next to the case. I took her camera, I took a photo of her. She walks away. I go, Well, we'll have your girlfriend take a picture too. So I hand the camera to the girlfriend and I tell the woman, Go stand on the other side of the case. So she does. Takes a picture. No problem. Everything's fine. We leave. We go to the cemetery to see Ed's grave. While we're there, walking away from the Ed's grave, the lady's tugging on my arm. She goes, can I show you something? She goes, can I ask you a question? I go, yeah. She goes, is this normal? And I go, what? She shows me the pictures that I took and the girlfriend took. <laughs> Behind Annabelle's eyes were other eyes looking left and then looking right on the two separate pictures. In other words, like this. And then looking that way at her. At her. Behind her eyes, those button eyes, or another set of eyes looking that way and looking that way. What? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. And so what does that tell you? And I never had that happen before. And she said, oh, I don't want you to publish them, but I'll let you, I'll, I'll email them to you. So she did. And they were, it's real. Oh, my God. 
question then. I didn't know that story until now. Since you've told me that we'll be able to come here, I've obviously been thinking about how I get to see Annabelle. You mean I've been thinking about like, oh, I get to see, and like not not just Annabelle, but everything here, and like well, I've what been thinking what you, about it. For yeah, what you're doing is you're energizing her. Recognition. Through the recognition. The, the more recognition you give to the doll, the more you even talk about the doll, the more recognition you give, the more energy you're giving it, mm -hmm. the more thought process you give to it. Whatever's attached to that doll, looking for a weakness in somebody, if somebody's so bent on seeing something, it's going to oblige, right? So that's why I say you don't challenge it, you don't look at it too much. So this case here was built by Dan Rivera. He's very knowledgeable in a lot of different areas, especially Santeria. But this says, accept existence of the devil. Just like you accept existence of God, you have to believe that there is a devil, because God created the devil too. This was the creature, the dinosaur, that David Glatzel had when he was a young man. And the devil made me do it case. This is the one artifact we have from the uh, from the house. This is the dinosaur that was seen crawling across the floor, floating across the carpeting, and a voice emanated from near it <clears throat> saying, you are all going to die. That was from The Conjuring 3 and from the book, The Devil in Connecticut by Gerald Brittle. Good book, it tells a true story. And in fact, Arnie Johnson is gonna be a guest speaker at our Paracon that we're having October 29th in the Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut, the Mohegan Sun, on October 29th. So if you want to learn a lot more about this case, especially too, uh, go to warrens.net, W-A-R-R-E-N-S.net. And there's tickets for sale. We're going to have a lot of good guest speakers. One who's a pretty big name that we're going to announce pretty soon. He and his wife are coming. and. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'll be speaking and Dan will be speaking too, but we have UFO people, we have cryptologists, we have all kinds of, of good people coming. And we're gonna have over 50 vendors. Do you have one other guest to bring in? Are you not mentioned? Are you not mentioned? Are you, are you bringing him? Oh yeah, we're gonna bring a guest uh, too. <laughs> we're gonna have a, a, a replication of the artifact room here. Oh, oh the whole not, thing? Not the whole thing, oh. but a lot of the important artifacts that we went over, the Annabelle doll for sure is coming. The movie Annabelle doll, the uh, really the worship idol, the say the uh, shadow, shadow doll, doll, the dinosaur, the conjuring mirror, the white lady that I didn't speak about yet, but I'll get to the white lady of Union Cemetery. Jeez. And so it's going to be fantastic. We had a really good turnout in a small Waterbury venue last year, but we figured the Mohegan Sun Casino is where it should actually be. We sold out in Waterbury, so we wanted to get a bigger venue. And it's going to be an honor of Ed Lorraine. It's going to be called the Warrens, Seekers of the Supernatural Paracon. Wow. And you guys are invited. <clears throat> you don't have to buy a ticket even. Oh, really? You guys don't have to buy a ticket. Well, they, they <laughs> do, right? <laughs> Joan and Evan have to. Yeah, they have to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Everybody else has to buy a ticket. <laughs> These guys right here. This is an actual skull used in satanic rituals. What do they do in satanic rituals? Well, they sacrifice animals and humans. But you're going to have a lot of people saying, that's not what Satanists do. You're, this guy's full of it. Who's this jerk talking about Satanists? <laughs> well, I'm the jerk that's going to tell you that real Satanists destroy animals and they destroy humans. And why do they do that? They do it to gain power in the devil's eyes. It's like they're giving up something that the devil hates. Because in, in the devil's eyes, anything that's created in God's image is a hated image, and you, ladies and gentlemen, are created in God's image. Nothing better than to kill a human being, or a baby. Why a baby? Well, a baby's innocent. And the more innocent they figure, the more power they get from the devil. Uh, in fact, the main prize would be a young child. So what they do is they take members of the cult, the satanic cult, and they impregnate them for a specific reason of getting the uh, person pregnant to have the baby, then to kill the baby, and then to eat, drink the blood, and rip off the skin, and eat the skin and flesh of the baby. So, are Satanists bad people? You bet your ass they're bad people. So, that's going to be on display. That's an actual human skull that was given to Ed. Wow. Wow. Ed collects the Ouija boards from people who can't use them anymore, or shouldn't <laughs> use them anymore. Yeah. And why shouldn't you use that? Why wouldn't you use the Ouija board? It's just a game. Mm -hmm. That's not true. That is a conduit to the other side. That's like a telephone to the other side. 
What are you doing? You're asking questions of the unknown realm. Put my hand on that planchet and say, I want to speak to a spirit. You're not saying specifically who, right? Mm -hmm. Any mm -hmm. spirit can come through. Or, I want to speak to my grandma, Josephine. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe something's happening. I mean, let me verify that it's her. A demonic entity can read your mind. As far as I'm concerned, from what we've learned, they can read your mind. It's not guesswork. They know what you're thinking. So if you're thinking the red bicycle, they pick it up. Yeah. Now you're convinced it's your grandmother. Now you invited them in. Oh, Graham, nice to talk to you. So you just invited in the unknown realm. And once you invite that in, what they want to do, a demonic entity, is destroy a human in some fashion, either physically or emotionally. Have you get broken up in your marriage, have fights, dysfunction, chaos, lose your job, start drinking. Remember I said they attack you on the weakest level that you have. Like a witch could say, I want something bad to happen to Tony, to Elton, and nothing happens right away. It could happen in, in a few months. They pick the time and the date. Mm -hmm. It's like the devil. When you say, well, like, if I challenge Annabelle, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to happen that instant. It could happen a month later, a year later. But Ed, every time we were in here, he'd say, don't touch anything. Every time I come in here with him, and I was here in here with him hundreds of times, he would always reiterate to me, that's why I knew Ed was real and legitimate, was he never like would like lose a moment and go, that is all BS, you know, yeah. never. Or say, yeah, don't worry about it, you can grab that, that's okay, never. Yeah. He'd be like, don't touch that, if you touch it, let me know. This is knowing him for years, he'd say, if you touch, and don't stare at Annabelle. He would say stuff like that to me, knowing me so well. Hmm. He wasn't trying to impress me, he was trying to protect me. Yeah. So, and that's what I try to do when I bring people in here to show them that this stuff is real. And people, like I said before, why do you keep it? Ed told me he kept it for evidence. You're welcome to come to the Paracon if we have an extra seat, uh, we're table. Gonna, we're going to give him a table, too. Oh, really? Oh, we're yeah. going to be at the Paracon <laughs> <laughs> October 29th. Where is it going to be? Mohegan Sun. Mohegan hey, can you, Sun. One, one, uh, one condition, though. I get to be in, in a life size replica case of Annabelle sitting in it. So I'll be in a bigger know. case. Oh, but, but they can throw a ball and you Yeah, yeah, the but water. they throw a ball and then I, I, bad idea. And then I drop I like it. You can build it, right? You know, I like that idea. Okay. Could, I could build a case and put it in the lobby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll just, I'll just sit in there. It and they can uh -huh. take their pictures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you're, that's but a great if idea. But if you're, fan, if you're fans of these, these wonderful <laughs> guys, if you're fans, come and see them at the Paracon. You know, he can sign October 29th. There you go. Warren's okay. net, right? we got to mark off our calendar. But, we do. We didn't know <laughs> we were going to be there until right now. Remember, yeah. these, guys are, are, these guys are very respectful. Oh. And that's what we wanted. That's why we let them in. And certain other people we rejected. They've asked us before these guys asked us, and we said no. It's because of their attitude. Appreciate it. These guys, when they asked us, <clears throat> they did it almost like with a reverence to the museum and to Ed and Lorraine. And that's the reason why Dan and me and Chris and Eric said, yeah, okay, we're gonna have you in, come on in. We appreciate it. They're very nice guys, they love what they do, and they believe in what they do, and that's, that's the key, believing in what you do. Appreciate it, man. And, Thank uh, you. So I hope you have 10 million subscribers <laughs> soon. Yeah. What was your question, Corey? Um, can I ask so. some questions outside of this building? Sure. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, sure. cool. Sure. Well, I guys want to show you one thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this oh, is yeah. the haunted oh. passageway. Oh, yeah, I forgot to show you the passageway. Yeah, turn the light on, Dan. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, as paintings are lining the wall, if you want to, you'll see. Follow Dan oh, those in. Those are his paintings right Follow there. Dan in. So this passageway. When we held our lectures, Ed and Lorraine held their lectures in the house. After the lectures, they would have their guests come through the passageway from the basement into the museum. So wow. this leads right to the house. Oh, wow. So, uh, no follow me. This is incredible. No way. And actually, if you investigate in here, oh. you'll capture some good evidence, too. Oh, wow. Whoa. You this hear that? Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So on the walls here are Ed's paintings. Just want to oh. take a look. No. This is amazing. Oh, this is incredible. Look at this casket. <laughs> That's a real casket. That's a real casket? Uh, there was a man that was into this practice. He would sleep in that casket. Whoa. So that was also given to Ed. Wow. wow. That room on the other side of that door is the Halloween room. That's where Ed would hold his lectures, you know, back in the day. He'll yeah. have like 10 people come to the house. He would have them come in the basement, 
talk about the paranormal. He would show a video of Maurice. If you heard about Maurice, the, the man that was possessed in uh, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. he would show that exorcism to them in this little 13 inch TV. Jeez. Yeah. In that room over there. Oh, what that uh, must have been like. So when you're doing inve your investigation, I suggest maybe one person in this passageway. Perfect. Okay. Somebody all the way at the other end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you're going to try to do any kind of communications, you know, just be careful what you ask for because you're going to you're going to get it. Okay. All right. Well, what if? I mean, I'm assuming you guys have investigated. We this investigated place many times, right? Um, we only did it one time. Only one time. Whoa. Only one time. Wow. Just in and that was the last time, and we we're not going to do it again. Why? Um, because we don't want to give the items that attention. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're around it all the time. Yeah. So we don't want to be affected by yeah, these items. Of course, of course. And there's more reasons why we go to church. We have a blessing. We go to mass. Go to confession. You know, we help people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have these items. We bring them out to the public where we can educate them. Yeah. That evil does exist. So as been doing it, we're continuing that legacy. Got it. All right. So uh, how often are people doing investigations here? Is it incredibly rare? Because I mean, as far as I looked, I couldn't actually find one. Um, like paranormal investigations here. People like how often are those happening here? In this museum? Yeah. We never have anybody investigate this museum. Okay, that's that's what, when I was doing my homework right. on it. I couldn't find any. Right, right. No, you. Other than us, and I told you. Yeah. You're gonna have this museum to investigate. You're gonna be the first ones investigating this museum. Yeah. All right. We brought Annabelle down to Las Vegas. All right. But we pulled it. I mean, Tony pulled Annabelle right out of there when Zach went to oh. touch her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, we suggest that you don't touch any items. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, we're watching. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're... You know, um, Ed did that when the, the guy touched the doll, he was mocking the doll, and he said, son, you need to leave. We won't hesitate to tell you that. Yeah, yeah, for All sure. Right, so, just, just respect the items. Of course. But do your thing, you know. Um, yeah. And see what you're able to capture. Wow. Appreciate it. Wow. Thank, thank you for yeah. this having us. All right. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, man. Thank you. It's an honor, right. truly, it's to be here. I know you guys, some experience. of you just didn't know that you were coming here tonight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I had no idea. <laughs> so you can scratch that off your bucket Jeez. list. Yeah. Actually, is, by the way, my main channel, TFIL, the bucket list, is number 666 on the list, oh. was to come here. All right. So just remember, you're in the, <laughs> one of the most haunted locations in the world. Yeah. All right, so a lot of these items do have attachments, some demonic, and some could be earthbound spirits, but they all intermingle. All right, so you'll hear voices, you can hear something growling, yeah. you just don't know where it's coming from. Wow. Yeah. All right. You know, I don't, I don't know too much about you, but it seems like your eyes are like watering a little bit talking about it. Oh, I get emotional about yeah. this because, you know, I was mentored by Lorraine. Huh? All right, and... Um, she prom, you know, she made me promise to keep this going yeah. with Tony. So yeah. Yeah. I take it to heart. Of course, of course. So you know, I'm not doing this for fame or anything like that. No. It's because I love this, and I want this to keep going. Wow. Yeah. This All is right. incredible. Of course. Sure. And that story Tony told you about Annabelle with the guy in the motorcycle. Yeah. Mm. I was eight years old, driving down Route 25. A guy and his girlfriend come flying by us on a motorcycle. Whoa. All right. My father says they're going to get into an accident. As soon as we got to the end of the connector, there's the motorcycle on the side of the road. The girl's on the side of the road holding her head, and her boyfriend went into the tree line, and he had died. Now, I didn't know that at the time, that that was my connection to this location. You were there. I was there when it happened. So, years later, I'm working with the Warrens. Enjoy yourself. Oh, thank you, Will. Thank, thank you. you. This is intense this is once in a lifetime it really is once in a lifetime man it's it's really like so many items so we're like like the only people besides them that's ever investigated here yeah yeah and we're doing basically two because we're going to do one and then we're going to come back in at three in the morning yeah so we're going to watch them put annabelle from here into here yeah I did when I had my replica made. I had no idea that this one was this large. That was the one. Yeah. I had, like basically modeled it after. Yeah. Wow. That's so crazy. I'll let you walk in first and just scan it. Small. Almost the way you had left it. It's almost the way you had left it. Wow. So as he turned this into the museum, then he started doing all of his other work in here, his research and everything. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, he had that 
caucus for a long, long time. Oh wow, look at the tape recorders. Towards the end, was he still painting? Oh wow. Oh yeah. yeah. Up until the time he got sick, until the time he collapsed, up to 2001. All the old he cameras paint. too. Cameras yeah. used by Warren. <coughs> Remember the Conjuring 2? Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so they're the kind of recorders he used to use. Jeez. He used these kind of recorders. He, this is his painting here. He did the Witch of Glam's Castle. That's in Scotland. Glam's yeah. Castle. It had this box for many, many years that he would bring on a case with him. And in it, he'd have a cross. It's a cross, not a crucifix. Crucifix would have Jesus on it. It not called a crucifix. That's just a cross, it's called. He'd have manual of prayers he had another uh, religious book here he'd have holy water and there's another book and he also he would keep his uh, his crucifix in here that he put around his neck a big one mm. and he took this on all the and he'd take incense he had incense in here too high spiritual pontifical incense that was blessed by a priest he'd have everything blessed before he went on a case this is me and ed in the range back in the day yeah we did that <laughs> wow. Look how young I was. Look how young I was, huh? Yeah. Wow. I don't see bad, did I? <laughs> no. I looked a little like uh, Bradley Cooper there, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. A, lot, a lot like Bradley Everybody's Cooper. Going, yeah, yeah. Oh, was, wow. His father was a prize fighter, you know. Really? Yep. And he was in the Navy in World War I. Ed was a tough guy, you know. Yeah. I mean, maybe he didn't look into some of the things, but he was brought up on the uh, bad side of Bridgeport, mm -hmm. and he had to fight his way up. He fought. And his father taught him how to box too. So, so the Amityville Horror slide presentation by Anne Lorraine. Weird. Like everything in this room is a reason why we even do what we do today. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the key, you know. That's the key is. Well, I'll tell you one more quick story if I could. Yeah, could I? of course. It was 19 years old, I think, or going on 19, when his ship collided with an oil tanker. Everybody on the ship had to abandon the ship because the tanker blew up and it's flames all over the place. So they all had to jump ship because of the flames and the, and the ship was sinking. He saw guys going under for the last time. He said it was just terrible. That's awful. But there were 69 survivors on that ship. He was one of them. Now, none of this would be here. There'd be no Conjuring movies. No. No, no Judy, no my wife, no Lorraine happening. Nothing if he wasn't saved when he was 18 years old. Yeah. You know, when you think about that kind of wow. stuff, it's amazing that everything's for a reason. He was a good guy, man, the best. He did a lot for Judy and me, and so did, of course, Lorraine, but Ed gave me a lot of knowledge. He used to, I used to pick his brain yeah. and ask him questions about, well, how do you know this, Ed? How do you know a devil does this? He would have all the answers. But then he said to me one time, he goes, hey, nobody has all the answers. Yeah. He goes, anybody tells you they have all the answers, they're full of it. Yeah. He goes, you're not meant to have all the answers. That's the mysteries of the universe. Yeah. God meant it that way, or else we would know all the answers. You'd know exactly what heaven's like. Exactly. Yep. Right? Yeah. So, all right, guys. All the cases that he worked on, he would be listening to it over here. <laughs> That's right. I, I, absolutely. Thank um, you. This is this has been well, the best welcome. tour. Th welcome. Thank you so much, man. This is this is incredible. I let you guys in because you're good guys, and to do a detailed, you know, tour and detailed walkthrough or investigation. Like I said, a lot of people before you have asked, and I said no. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to ask me after this, and I'm going to say no. Obviously, I'm not trying to do anything wrong here. So when we're asking questions here, you know, by, in theory, we're also opening it to anything in here to answer us. Yeah. Right? Okay, right. So Here's what you do. Yeah. First, like I said, the white light around your bodies, and if you want to be safe, give it to him, and he gives it to you. He envisions and he asks for God's protection, right? That's number one. Yeah. Number two is if you want to investigate City Annabelle doll, you would say out loud, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, allow me to photograph Annabelle without any problems. Well, you, you, don't, you don't ask questions of these items. You don't say, tell me something, Annabelle, or move for me. You don't do that. Okay. What you do is, in the name of God, respectfully ask you, God, to protect me from any of these artifacts that I'm photographing and videoing and to ensure that nothing happens to us while we're here or after. You know, with total respect, God, we're trying to learn about the other realm. As long as you're being respectful, not challenging, you're going to be all right. Okay. And protecting yourself. I mean, do not challenge the demonic. 
Um, I have somebody in here that did challenge the demonic, and he was possessed, and he ended up killing somebody. Jesus. Now, I want you guys to meet him, and he could tell you what happens when you do that. Um, so, come inside into the kitchen. I got Arnie Johnson waiting in the kitchen. Um, he's you know the Arnie one. Johnson is, right? Yeah. 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 So, that's the one that made the movie, The Devil Made Me Do It. You want to have yeah. him on video? Um, you want to do a video? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah I'll, okay. I'll have him come out here, and um, we'll have right, somebody go in there. Yeah, yeah. come <laughs> in there. Come on. Come on. Wow. Go change whatever you need to change right now. We, we have, have to. Guy. A nice guy. He lost his wife back in April of last year, one year. Now Arnie tried to defend Debbie's younger brother David, the one with the creature. So I didn't know Arnie was coming tonight. And uh, Arnie challenged what was bothering David Lasso. He said, Stop bothering that. He's just a kid. Come to me. Now, Arnie was 18 at the time. Come to me. I'm a man. And what happened? He doesn't remember what happened. Really? But he got stabbed the guy to death, Arnie, in the backyard, in his kennel. So, and he went to prison for five years. So, go ahead.